بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار مرحبا بكم اهلا وسهلا جميعا we continue with the explanation of sharh sunnah by the noble imam Imam al-Barbahari rahimahullah ta'ala using the explanation of the noble sheikh al-Allama one of the kibar ulama in our time the noble sheikh Salih al-Fawzan hafizahullah ta'ala in the last class we left off with something from the biography of al-Imam al-Barbahari the level of his knowledge and how he was considered to be an Imam and also was mentioned in his biography that he was one who was upon piety and asceticism and is mentioned لَقَدْ عُرِفَ الْإِمَامُ الْبَرْبَهَارِ بِالزُّهْدِ وَالْوَرَعَ the Al-Imam al-Barbahari, he was known for asceticism and he was known for his piety. And what is meant by the asceticism is not the false practice of asceticism by the likes of Ahl al-Tasawwuf, the Sufis, where they walk around with holes in their garments, and they abstain from seeking a living when they are individuals who they are responsible for and they neglect those people this is not asceticism rather this is negligence the asceticism that is being mentioned here is that al-imam al-barbahari rahimahullah ta'ala he was not an individual who was chasing after the dunya, and he was content with that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
has given him. And he did not indulge in the affairs that were of no benefit and concern of his. And he was a man that was pious. He had piety. And he kept away from the doubtful matters. He kept away from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited. And these are characteristics that are befitting for one to adorn oneself with asceticism and piety. Not being an individual who's chasing after the dunya, compromising his religion. Nam. Not being an individual who's chasing after the dunya, compromising his or her religion. Not being an individual who indulges in matters which are of no concern and no benefit. Wasting of one's time. Doing that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He described the disbelievers with a despicable description, establishing how they are when it comes to the life of this world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this description in the Quran. For what purpose? For us to keep away from it. And never to adorn ourselves with this type of characteristic. Allah mentions in Surah Al-A'raf, verse number 176. Allah Ta'ala, وَلَوْ شِدْنَا لَرَفَعْنَاهُ بِهَا وَرَاكِنَّهُ أَخْلَدَ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ وَاتَّبَعَ هَوَاهُ فَمَثَلُهُ كَمَثَلِ الْكَلْبِ إِنْ تَحْمِلْ عَلَيْهِ يَلْحَثِ أَوْ تَطْرُقْهُ يَلْحَثِ ذَلِكَ مَثَلُ الْقَوْمِ الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا فَاقْتُصِ الْقَصَصَ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, and had we willed, we would have surely elevated him with it. But he clung to the earth, and he followed his own evil desires. So the likes of him, or the similarity of him, is the similarity of a dog. If you drive him away, he sticks his tongue out panting. Or if you leave him alone, he still sticks his tongue out and he pants. Such is the example of the people who reject our verses. So relate their stories, perhaps they may reflect. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Qayyim al jawziyah Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He commented on this verse. Mentioning that this is the example that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has given describing the disbeliever who clings to the dunya. And that he described him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, with being similar to a dog. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he described this individual with being similar to the dog and the reason being the dog is that animal that has the least patience when it comes to drinking water the dog is that animal that has the least patience when it comes to the drinking of water if you give the dog a drink of water the dog will still pant after drinking the water and if you don't give the dog a drink of water the dog is going to pant and stick his tongue out thirsty for the water Sheikh al Islam Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah rahimahullah ta'ala he mentioned that this is the similarity of the kafir when it comes to the life of this world that if you give him something from the dunya he pants and he still wants more and if you don't give him anything from the life of this world from this dunya he's panting and he wants it this is a blameworthy despicable characteristic that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described the disbelievers with and along with these characteristics that have been mentioned here in the verse is that these individuals they follow their desires this is not being one who is zahid this is not having zuhud being an individual who follows his desires whatever his desires pull him to he follows and this is another blameworthy characteristic that the disbelievers they have with them that they are individuals who just follow their whims no matter how far it takes them And these individuals who disbelieve in Allah, they reject the ayat of Allah. These characteristics that are mentioned in this verse, they go against a zuhud and they go against al wara. They go against the characteristic of asceticism and the characteristic of fear. So when we look at the a'imma, Barakallahu fikum. The Emma, they were not individuals who followed their whims and their desires. Rather, disciplined themselves with the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, with the understanding of the Sahaba. Radiyallahu. Sa'ala anhum ajma'in. We find that our righteous predecessors they were individuals who were quick in adhering to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of the affairs, in the affairs of aqidah in the affairs of ibadah as well as the matters of akhlaq the matters of having good character as well as in the affairs of mu'amala and how we deal with one another in our transactions and other than that this is the meaning of being a person who is zahid 
or being a person who has wara, who has piety, fulfilling the commandments of Allah, keeping away from the prohibitions, being quick to be obedient to Allah, and very hesitant when it comes to opposing the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sunnah of his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is mentioned <clears throat> وَمِمَّا يَدُلُّ عَلَى هَذَا مَا ذَكَرَهُ أَبُو الْحَسِنْ إِبْنُ بَشَّارِ قَالَ تَنَزَّهَ الْبَرْبَهَارِ مِنْ مِرَاثِ أَبِيهِ عَنْ سَبْعِينَ أَلْفَ دِرْهَمْ It is mentioned well, from that which indicates that he was a man of asceticism and piety is that which had been mentioned by Abu al-Hasan ibn Bashar. He stated that al-Barbahari, he left off the inheritance of his father, which was about 70,000 dirhams. And that's a, a large sum of wealth. And he left it off. Wallahu alam. It doesn't mention the reason, but probably he's seen that it would have been a distraction for him. Distracting him from that which is of greater importance and more better for him. Some people, not all, but some people, if they was to have a lot of wealth, that this would divert them. From the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some people, if they have no wealth, this poverty can lead them to kufr. So Allah gives this one and holds back from the other. In any event, Allah knows best what was the reason behind Al Imam al Barbahari leaving off the inheritance of. His father, which is the sum of 70,000 dirham. But in any event, it was an indication that he wasn't a person who had a strong desire of the dunya. In another place, it's not mentioned here in this work, Ibn al Jawzi he mentioned, Tanazaha an mirathi abihi li amrin kariha. The Al Imam al Barbahari he left off the inheritance of his father due to a matter that he dislikes. It's not mentioned here in the Explanation of Sheikh Salih Fawzan, but is mentioned in other places that point. The next point is the statement of Ibn Abi Ya'la. He stated, كَانَ لِلْبَرْبَهَارِ مُجَاهَدَاتِ وَمُقَامَاتِ فِي الدِّينِ كَثِيرًا that Al-Imam al-Barbahari, rahimahullah, he had many efforts and many strivings in the religion. Meaning that Al-Imam al-Barbahari, rahimahullah ta'ala, he exerted himself in giving the da'wah, spreading the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And teaching the people their religion. And clarifying the affairs for the general masses of the Muslims. And defending the religion from the innovation to the people of innovation. This is something that a person is thanked for. Because this is a great duty and responsibility. This is taking upon the job 
of the Prophet Sallallahu in relation to giving da'wah. The messengers that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent to mankind, they strove and exerted themselves in teaching the people the religion of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And they strove and exerted themselves in standing firm in the face of polytheism and the people of polytheism. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, this establishes the virtues of a person calling to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which should be an encouragement for all of us to establish ourselves upon knowledge by sitting with the ulama of Islam if we have the ability to do so and learning directly from them and taking the positions that they take and then after being individuals who are grounded in the principles of the religion that we should propagate that which we know and that which we correctly understand from the deen. Allah mentions in Surah Al-Fusilat, verse number 33, وَمَنْ قَوْلًا مَنْ مَنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, and who is better in speech? Then the one who calls to Allah and he does righteous actions. And he says, indeed, I am from amongst the Muslims. So Allah has established here that the one who calls to his religion, that this individual is from the best of those, or from this individual speaks with the best of speech. But we see in the verse, Allah also mentions along with calling, that the person he does righteous actions. We don't want to be from amongst the people good, but then we forget our own selves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blamed the Yahud for this characteristic, and this blame is not just for them, rather it's for anyone who falls into this affair, of commanding the people, calling the people to that which is good, but forgetting oneself. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Baqarah, أَتَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبِرِّ وَتَنْسَوْنَ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ تَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, and Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 44. Do you command the people with righteousness, but you forget your own selves? While you also read the scripture, do you not have any sense? Although this verse came down in relation to criticizing the Yehud, as there is a well-known principle in the, the foundations of the tafsir, Al-Ibra bi ulum al-lav wa laysa bi khusus al-sabab Al-Ibra bi umum al-lav wa laysa bi khusus al-sabab The points of benefit that we take from the Quran is based upon the generality of the wording and not due to the specific reason the verse came down so if there is someone from amongst the Muslims who commands the people with that which is right, but he forgets himself, he can't say if the individual is reminded of his negligence of himself, 
that that verse is for the Jews. Naam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the verse down condemning the Jews, criticizing the Jews. But that verse is also for anyone from amongst the Muslim who take on that characteristic that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blamed the Jews for. So Al-Imam al-Barbahari rahimahullah he had praiseworthy positions in this religion. And he had praiseworthy efforts that he put forth in the religion. And the students of Al-Imam al-Barbahari were many and plenty. And from those who benefited from him, Al-Imam al-Qudwa al-Faqih, Abu Abdullah, Ubaidullah, Ibn Muhammad al-Uqbari, Al-Ukbari Al-Ma'roo Bibni Batta <coughs> And from those who benefited from Al-Imam Al-Barbahari The Imam The Qudwa Meaning the good example The Faqih, the jurist Abu Abdullah Ubaidullah Ibn Muhammad Al-Ukbari Who was well known by Ibn Batta the efforts that were put forth by the likes of Ibn Batta are well known in his defense of the Sunnah is well known and also from those that have been mentioned Al-Imam Al-Wa'id Al-Kibir Muhammad Ibn Ahmed Ibn Ismail Al-Baghdadi Abu Al-Hussein Ibn Sam'un the Imam the admonisher, the preacher, Muhammad ibn Ahmad ibn Ismail, who was Baghdadi, he was Abu Hussein ibn Sam'un. Then, for the students that were mentioned, Ahmad ibn Kamil ibn Khalaf ibn Shajara, Abu Bakr al Qadi. And also from those who mentioned Al-Imam Al-Faqih Al-Hussein Ibn Abdullah Al-Baghdadi Al-Hambali Abu Ali Al-Najjad Al-Sagheer And he died around 360 Hijrah And the last that was mentioned here Muhammad Ibn Ahmed Ibn Saleh Ibn Al-Imam Ahmed Ibn Hanbal So we have the grandson here Of Imam Ahmed or rather the great-grandson of Imam Ahmed, who was one of the students of Al-Imam al-Barbahari. The great-grandson of Al-Imam Ahmed is one of the students of Al-Imam al-Barbahari. Now, it is important that we know who are the students of the scholars. <coughs> Due to the students, when benefiting from the scholars, they carry that knowledge of the scholars, especially after the death of the scholars, it is their students who carry the knowledge that they carried from their teachers, who carried from their teachers, who carried from their teachers, all the way back to the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum ajma'een, who learned directly from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who received the revelation from Jibreel Alayhi Salam who was commanded by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to take the revelation to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So it was important that we know who are the students of the ulama for they are the ones who carry the knowledge of the ulama and as a side note, and this was a point of benefit that was mentioned by Sheikh Ahmed Bazmul, Hafizullah Ta'ala, that although a person studied with the ulama, that it's still good to ask about that individual, impossible, because the person may have changed. 
the person may have changed. So the point is, we don't just merely go off of an individual having studied with the Mashiach. The point is, has the, has the individual remained upon the methodology of his Sheikh? Because how many of the people, as an example, those who used to sit with Sheikh Al-Albani, Rahimahullah, and benefit from Sheikh Al-Albani, when he was in Jordan, at the head of them, Ali Hassan Al-Halabi. Now look at Ali Hassan Al-Halabi. He deviated from the methodology of his Sheikh. And you have individuals who studied with others from amongst the Mashiach who deviated from the methodology of the Sheikh. So, being that that individual studied with the Sheikh, that can't be used anymore as a teskia or a praise for the person because the person is no longer following that which that Sheikh has taught him. And that's not mentioning that one of the names mentioned here that one of these individuals deviated, I'm mentioning a side point that the Shaykh Ahmed Bazmur Hafizullah Ta'ala mentioned in relation with the individuals who have who are known to have studied with the Mashaykh. We want to see is the person still upon that methodology of the Shaykh. We have individuals who studied in Medina University and they were there with the Mashaykh going, going to the classes of the Mashaykh who taught in Medina University and who taught outside of Medina University. But now when you look at them in the stances that they have taken, we find that they are in opposition to what was taught to them by the Mashaykh of al sunnah wal Jamaa when they were in Medina University. The last matter that was mentioned was the trials and tribulations and the death of this noble Imam, Al-Imam al-Barbahari, rahimahullah. Al-Imam al-Barbahari, as mentioned, he had a lot of efforts that he put forth and praise with the stances that he took in the religion. And those who were in opposition, meaning those who were in opposition to the Kitab and the Sunnah, <coughs> with the understanding of the Sahaba. And this is when a person is described as being in opposition. Barakallah fikum. It's not a, the person is opposing an individual. No, the person is in opposition to the text. This is when a person is described as being in opposition. It is possible that two individuals from Ahl Sunnah may differ with one another, one opposing the other. But the individual, or both individuals, they may not have opposed the kitab and the sunnah. That's not a necessity. Maybe they're differing and opposing one another in a, a worldly matter. So there's some discrepancy between them. But it's not an issue to where one of them has opposed the book of Allah or the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the methodology of the Sahaba. Or you may find that an individual has opposed an individual due to that which has come from a person for them being in opposition to the Kitab and the Sunnah but you find individuals describe the other as being in opposition because they have opposed the quote unquote one who has the bigger name or the one who has the more the most popularity. So you go against that individual, even if the individual is correct in going against the one who quote unquote has the most popularity, the people say you are in opposition to the principles of Ahl Sunnah wal Jamaah. SubhanAllah, this is his beer. How can a person be described as going against the principles of Ahl Sunnah wal Jamaah? When the person hasn't opposed none of the matters of aqidah, or none of the matters of minhaj, or the affairs of ibadah. How can a person be described as going against the qawad of salafiyah when the person hasn't opposed the qawad of salafiyah, but rather the he has opposed the quote-unquote personality. He has, a, he has opposed the individual who's quote-unquote the elder, 
or someone who endow or on knowledge or the likes. So you find individuals rallying behind this individual who has the popularity and whoever opposes him, even if they're correct in opposing him and criticizing him, they say, no, you're opposing Salafiyya now. SubhanAllah wa bihamdi. This was not the understanding of the scholars of the past in relation to a person being in opposition to Salafiyya, nor of the scholars of today. When we find <clears throat> the scholars as an example, criticizing the people who have won against Sheikh Rabia, it was not because he's Sheikh Rabia. Understand this. It's because of what Sheikh Rabia, Hafizullah Ta'ala, has presented from the truth, and the people of innovation opposed him in that. So when they say they went against the Sheikh, meaning they went against the evidences that was brought by the Sheikh, and the proofs, and the principles that was established by the Sheikh and his refutation or his advice to an individual. Not the Sheikh his, himself. Understand this point. <clears throat> so those who are in opposition, meaning those who are in opposition to the Kitab and the Sunnah, the understanding of the Sahaba, يَغِيظُونَ قَلْبَ Sultan Ali. They was planting the seeds of hatred into the heart of the Sultan against Al-Imam Al-Barbahari. Understand, Ikhwan, Barakallahu Fikum, Wa Ahsan Allahu Ilayk. This is from the ways of the people of innovation. What is that? Being that they cannot deal with the people of the Sunnah, and they cannot do away with the people of the Sunnah, and specifically the ulama of the Sunnah, and their students who hold to their way and their teachings, based upon the Kitab and the Sunnah, the understanding of the Sahaba, being that the people of innovation can't deal with these individuals, because the people of innovation, they're weak in argument, in reality. For those who have knowledge and are grounded in knowledge, the people of innovation, they're weak in their arguments. So what do they do? They try to go to the authorities and turn the authorities against the people of the Sunnah. Because they can't handle the people of the Sunnah, they start planting the seeds of hatred and, 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 and dissension in the hearts of the rulers and of the people in authority against the people of the Sunnah. So what? So that these people who are in authority can stop the people of the Sunnah from teaching. This is the methodology of the Hizbiyun, the methodology of the Mubtadi'un. They have been doing this for centuries. He did it with the likes of Imam Ahmed, Rahimahullah. He did it with Al-Imam Al-Barbahari, Rahimahullah. He did it with the likes of Shaykh Al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah. All of the times that Shaykh Al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah was in prison, was behind the innovators going to the rulers and lying to them on Shaykh Al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, and planting or sowing the seeds of dissension in the heart, and enmity and hatred in the heart, of the rulers for the people of the Sunnah. So Ibn Taymiyyah was locked up on different occasions behind the deviants turning the rulers against him. And we even seen it here, subhanAllah wa bihamdi, from the likes of an individual, his name is uh, Shamsi Ali. When that report had came out, the NYPD report came out in relation to uh, terrorism and what are the signs of the people becoming terrorists or on their way to become terrorists. This individual, Shams Ali, and I'm not quoting him word for word, but the meaning of his statement in conjunction with this was that the root of terrorism here in America are the Salafis. SubhanAllah wa bihamdi. How could he make a statement like this when it is Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah who are the staunchest of the people against the terrorists and the terrorist activities? No one has refuted the Irhabiyun and Al Irhab 
the terrorists and the terrorism. No one has refuted the terrorists and the terrorism like the scholars of Ahl Sunnah and the students of the ulama from Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. No one. No one. So what was the intent behind this individual? He knows that he has been warned against. He knows that he has refuted errors and for his evil activities. So he tried to try to turn the government here against Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. It is mentioned in the year 321 during the Khilafah of Al Qahir and his Wazir Ibn Muqla that he intended to arrest Al Imam al Barbahari. So Al Imam al Barbahari he went into hiding. And a group of his major students they were arrested. And they were taken to Basra. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he punished Ibn Mulkla Ibn Muqla for what he did. And this shows Barakallah Fikum that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's not heedless of that which the criminals do. When people they do crimes of transgression against the people of the Sunnah <clears throat> that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he knows that which has been done. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions <coughs> in Surah Al-Buruj <coughs> how he had dealt with the disbelievers who harmed the believers for no reason. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he states is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions قُتِلَ أَصْحَابُ الْأُخْدُودِ النار ذات الوقود إذ هم عليها قعود وهم على ما يفعلون بالمؤمنين شهود وما نقم منهم إلا أن يؤمنوا بالله العزيز الحميد الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض والله على كل شيء شهيد إن الذين فتنوا المؤمنين والمؤمنات ثم لم يتوبوا فلهم عذاب جهنم ولهم عذاب الحريق. الله سبحانه وتعالى he mentions <coughs> that the companions of the ditch are cursed. What is meant by <clears throat> the companions of the ditch are cursed men those people who dug the ditch for the believers in the story of the boy and the king. So Allah mentioned that those individuals were cursed not the people who were put in the ditch but those who dug the ditches for the believers. Ditches that were a fire fed with fuel. And when they sat by the fire, and they witnessed what they were doing against the believers, meaning in burning them to death. And the believers, those disbelievers had nothing against them. There was no crime committed by them, except that they believed in Allah, the Almighty, and the one who is worthy of all praise. The one who for him is the dominion of the heavens and the earth, and he is witness over all things. So meaning Allah, he witnessed what those disbelievers they did to the believers of no crime committed by them. So Allah mentions indeed those who put the believers to trial, the men and the women, meaning by torturing them and burning them. And they do not repent to Allah for what they have done against the believers, then they will have for them a punishment or torment in the hellfire, and they will have a burning punishment in the fire. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with the disbelievers who have harmed the believers for no reason. 
And this is a warning also to the people of innovation. That just as he subhanahu wa ta'ala punished the disbelievers of the past who harmed the believers for no reason, likewise these people of innovation can be punished. They may not receive the same punishment <clears throat> as the kuffar because the people of innovation who have not left Islam or their innovation hasn't taken them outside of the fold of Islam, if Allah punished them, they will eventually come out of the hellfire. But the point is, Allah punishing them for harming the believers. So the people of innovation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of what they do and their harms and attacks upon the people of the sunnah. So it is upon us to remain firm upon following the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even in the face of adversity and we are being harmed by the people whether they are disbelievers or they are Muslims from the people of innovation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions وَمَا كُنَّا عَنِ الْخَلْقِ غَافِلِينَ And we are not heedless of that which the creation does. So it is mentioned <coughs> that Allah, He punished Ibn Muqla for the action that He did by causing the Sultan Al-Qahir to become angry with him. So Ibn Muqla, he fled. And Al-Qahir, he removed him from the position of being the minister. And he set his house on fire. And Al-Qahir, his life was taken by Allah On a Wednesday in the 6th of the month of the last Jumada in the year 322 Hijri. And then after this individual was taken away, Ali Imam al-Barbahari, he returned to his position. And his position increased. His status increased. And this is due to him remaining firm <coughs> and steadfast and responding in a manner that was praiseworthy. Meaning that you do not find that Ali Imam al Barbahari, because the ruler wanted to do something to him and imprison him wrongfully, do not find that Al-Imam al-Barbahari, he called the people to revolt against the ruler. Rather, he was patient upon the harm that was being directed towards him, <clears throat> seeking the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, implementing the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and following the example of Al-Imam Ahmad rahimahullah who lived not too long before him. When Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala was going through the trials and the tribulations that he was going through and being tortured over the affair of the Quran being created, you never find with this, Imam Ahmed told the people to revolt against the ruler, although he was oppressed. This is the methodology of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah Ikhwan. It is mentioned that on the day that Abu Abdullah ibn Arafah, who was known as <coughs> Beniftawai, 
that he came to his janazah. And there were people present at the janazah like all of the people in the dunya. As well as the deen, the children of the dunya and the deen. And at the head of them was Al-Imam Al-Barbahari. Imam Al-Barbahari was the one who was at the head of the people in the, the janazah <coughs> of Abu Abdullah ibn Arafah. So the status of Imam Al-Barbahari increased and his word became prevalent and his companions became apparent and they spread out rebuking the people of innovation and this is what is to be done when Ahlul Sunnah is in a position of strength that they go about commanding the right and the forbidding of the wrong but you may find that Ahlul Sunnah may be in a state of weakness and they, been, and they are not able to command the right and forbid the wrong in the manner that they would be able to do if they were in a state of strength. So what is upon Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah to do in, in relation to the Mubtadi'ah? If they are in a state of weakness, call Allah Ta'ala, Fattakullah Mustata'atu. Fear Allah to the best of your ability. When we look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was in Mecca, he was not able to fulfill or to deal with the disbelievers in a manner that he was able to deal with them when he was established in Medina. And there are lessons in this that the ulama have extracted that when a person or people are in a state of weakness, their hal, their condition is different from when they are in a state of strength. But it's clear that <clears throat> when Ali Imam al-Barbahari and those who were with them were in a state of strength and their word became prevalent, meaning the teaching of the sunnah became prevalent, they went about ridiculing and rebuking the people of innovation. So under the pressure what do we find the innovators doing? Trying to turn in the heart of anyone who would listen to them against Al-Imam al-Barbahari. So, they came to Al-Radi, who was like the head of the police. He, was, he had a position of authority. They, they turned him against Al-Imam al-Barbahari. Going back to what was mentioned earlier about the ways of the people of innovation being that they are not able to withstand the refutations of Ahl sunnah wa Jama'ah, they turned to the authorities turning them against the people of the Sunnah so that these people of the Sunnah can be silenced and then they are left to go about spreading their innovations. This shows you the importance, Barakallahu Fiku, of the refutation of the scholars. Different from what we find the people of doubts stating today that the reading of the books of refutation are a waste of time and the like. SubhanAllah behind you. If you do not know the refutations of the ulama against the people of innovation, then how else are you going to protect yourself from the doubts that are presented by the people of innovation? The books of refutation play a major role in the preservation of this deen. And don't ever forget that. This doesn't mean, barakallahu fikum, that the person only reads the books of refutation and he doesn't read 
and study or learn from the scholars other than that, from what is obligatory upon them, from the affairs of aqidah and ibadah and akhlaq and mu'amala. No. There's a balance. But you find that people, they criticize us. They don't want us to read no books of refutation. They don't want us to refute anyone. They just want us to be quiet and let everyone do whatever they want to do. This is not from the deen of al-Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he commands us in his book to command the right and forbid the wrong. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in Surah Ali Imran, وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنَ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأُولَائِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ And let there be from amongst you a group of people calling to that which is good, commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. Those are the ones who are successful. That's Surah Ali Imran, verse 104. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connected success to commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. So now that means if we leave off commanding of the right and forbidding of the wrong, that this can lead to destruction and failure. And that's established in the authentic narrations. That when the people leave off the commanding of the right and forbidding the wrong, that Allah will send down upon them a punishment that will afflict everyone, and he will not remove it when they call upon him to remove it. So how can the people become upset when the scholars of Al-Islam and the students of the ulama, they refute the affairs of innovation or refute the errors of the people? How can the people become upset? How can the people claim that, oh, this is causing fitna? All you people talk about is refutations. Y'all causing fitna in the community. Subhanallah wa bihamdi. So we just leave the people to make the mistake? Why didn't these people say to those or whenever, hey, listen, you're causing fitna with your errors. That these mistakes that you're making are causing division amongst the people because we are all united upon the truth and now you're coming with these matters that are opposition to the Quran and the Sunnah, the understanding of the Sahaba. Why didn't you describe the people of innovation as being the fitna makers instead of describing the ulama and their students who refute them as being the fitna makers. This is from the characteristics of the people of falsehood. That they are upset when the scholars of Islam and the students of knowledge put forth the knowledge based refutations against those who are in opposition to the deen. So this individual Radi he came to Bedrin al Khorshani, who was the head of the uh, police, the Shurta. He came riding and calling out in Baghdad, "An la yajtamia min ashab al Barbahari nafsan." That no two people from the students of Imam al Barbahari are to gather together. So what happened? Imam al Barbahari had to go back into hiding. So, he used to be on the west side of town and he went to the east side of town until he died while he was in hiding in the month of Rajab in the, 20, in the, in the year of 329 Hijri. And some mentioned that he reached either 76 or 77 years of age. And it is mentioned that when he uh, was in hiding, or when he died in hiding, that is, that an ayah or, you say a mu'ajizah, excuse me, a mu'ajizah, took place like a a, a marvel or a tremendous sign of his righteousness 
was apparent as there was no one who knew of his death. But when the sister who was caring for him had came, she found that there were men in green garments praying over Al Imam al Barbahari. And then once they were finished praying over him, they dispersed. And it is stated that these were from the Malaika who took the form of men who had prayed over Al Imam al Barbahari, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. One matter we need to be aware of. That you have in some history books where they try to change the facts of history by stating that Al Imam al Barbahari and those who were with him were the fitna makers in Al Baghdad. The fitna of the Hanabila in Baghdad. And this is a lie. Upon Al Imam al Barbahari and those who are with him, they were not individuals who caused fitna. Rather, they were the individuals who were establishing the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But again, showing you the way to the people of falsehood, that when you find individuals who stand up for the religion, the people of Fossa described them as being fitna makers. Oh, this guy is a troublemaker. So why? Does he clarify some affairs of the religion? All oh, those ulama, all they do is talk about people. SubhanAllah, they're always making some fitna. SubhanAllah, why? Because they refuted the people of innovation that you love? The people have to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For indeed Allah will question them about their statements of describing the ulama. And describing the students of knowledge as being fitna makers or mushawishun. These people making tashwish and all this. Subhanallah wa bihamdi. This is a slander that the people are making against the people of the sunnah. The people be held accountable for their statements. For indeed that which causes the people to enter into hellfire the most. The hasaid of the alsina. The harvest of the tongues. You have to be mindful of their tongues. The flesh of the scholars is poison. And attacking the students of the ulama really is an attack upon the scholars. People have to be careful. The things that they say about the ulama who are the inheritors of the prophets and trying to describe them as being the fitna makers and the likes. So you have in <clears throat> mentioning in some accounts of history that they tried to say that Al-Imam Al-Barbahari and those who were with him that they were causing fitna in Baghdad and you find the likes of the Shia changing the facts of history and others from the people of innovation and misguidance Insha'Allah Ta'ala we will stop at this point Whatever is correct, praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And whatever is incorrect, it is for myself. Subhanaka Allahum wa bihamdik, shadawan la ila ila an, tistaghfiruka wa tubili. Naam. No, it's mentioned that from what we're seeing, because the question is regarding the statement that they were malaika praying over al barbahari we have no means meaning that she seen these individuals praying then when she came back they were gone that they they were soon the prayer was over they were gone so it stated that these were from the malaika and that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent in the form of men to pray over al imam al barbahari and it was a sign of 
his righteousness that Allah gave him that virtue and Allah knows best now now mihrab tafaddal the question is in the last dars when you provided us with the statements of the imams telling us not to make taqlid of them which was this directed to the students of the layman it's directed to all of the people No one is allowed to follow a person when he is going against the evidences from the Kitab and the Sunnah, whether the person is a student or a layman. And this is, if you go back to the introduction of the Prophet's prayer described by Imam Al-Albani, rahimahullah, you see what they intended. Like following them when their statements are in opposition to the statement of the Prophet ﷺ. This is blameworthy taqlid. Can't follow a scholar when his statement is a statement of error opposing the kitab and the sunnah. You can't follow that scholar. The, or even if the scholar is making ijtihad, the scholar is rewarded for his ijtihad, but he's not rewarded for the error. But we can't follow that scholar in his error. Well, we have to, the proof comes to us, we follow the proof. And the scholar, he's forgiven. Barakallah fi. Naam ziyad. Tashweesh. The question is, what is tashweesh? Tashweesh comes from shawwasha yushawishu tashweeshan. Like to be like a troublemaker, to cause problems. You have individuals who describe Ahl-Sunnah as being people of Tashweesh. And when you investigate what it's based upon, SubhanAllah wa bihamdi, it's personal matters or due to individuals refuting and bringing about clarity when other individuals were compromising in some affairs that they shouldn't have been compromising in. Or when an individual has been exposed for who he is. And the people know. So to turn the people away from that individual, and mainly the ulama, and you find them saying, oh, these scholars, they're making tashwish and they're you know, troublemakers and the likes. The, the, the intent or the goal behind that statement is to cause the people to have a bad doubt about the one who they're describing as having tashwish, to turn the people away from them and not take from them. That's the whole intent at the end of the day. So when you describe the people of Ahl Sunnah with Tashwish, and there is no Tashwish coming from them, rather when you listen to their lectures and their teachings and you look at their da'wah, they call them to the Book of Allah, they call them to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi with the understanding of the Sahaba. You see that this claim or the characteristic of Tashwish being described to Ahl Sunnah is a slander. People need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, if a person differs with an individual, subhanahu don't result to slandering. You know, if you, if you differ with an individual, you present what you have. If a person is in error or something that he has done, you know, you correct your brother. What's the result of slandering? And this is, if, you know, in relation to if the person is claiming to be from Ahl Sunnah. You know, if you see your brother from Ahl Sunnah in error, you correct him, advise him. You don't have the results of slandering him and the likes and turning the people away from him and warning against Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. Wallahi, this is incorrect. This is not the way of the ulama. Even when the ulama differed amongst themselves with some serious differing in some affairs, you don't find one scholar saying about the other scholar, oh, he's a mushawish, he's from Ahl Tashwish, and all this stuff. SubhanAllah bihamdi. But again, you find individuals using these tactics and these terminologies to put into the hearts of the people that they are talking to some type of doubt about the individual so that the people say, no, I'm not going to take from that person. And this is the tactic of the tactics of the people of innovation. They describe the people of the sunnah with these despicable nicknames to deter the people from them so that the people don't listen to them. Well, I, we have to be very careful in the things we say about one another. And first and foremost, be very careful 
regarding the things we say about the ulama. We cannot describe the ulama as being fitna makers and the people of Tashwish. No way. The ulama are waratatul anbiya, as the Prophet mentioned. The scholars are the inheritors of the Prophets. And their students, they are learning and taking from that inheritance that the ulama have inherited from the Prophet. Now, the question is how do we determine which scholar has a better or more complete understanding of the evidences when faced with two or more opposing opinions? This goes back to what the scholars have mentioned. Like the scholars have praised other scholars and regarding that which is their field of expertise and the likes that like you find the ulama in their praises for the likes of Al-Imam Al-Albani Rahimahullah and that Al-Imam Al-Albani Rahimahullah he was a scholar of hadith the scholars Nam, the ulama have mentioned in describing Shaykh Al-Albani Rahimahullah as being like from the ulama of hadith and that there is no one uh, in this era that has reached the level that he has reached in relation to the science of hadith and the like. So you find the scholars, they praise other scholars regarding their fields of expertise and the likes. So we know from this, this way, not based upon our limited knowledge, no, based upon what the ulama have said. So the ulama have mentioned that when the, ulama, when the scholars differ, in a matter, if the individual does not have the ability to determine which of the scholars holds the correct position based upon the proofs and the evidence, then the individual looks at which of the two scholars has more knowledge than the other. And if it is seen that they are equally matched in knowledge, then you find some of the ulama mentioning, mashallah, which of the two scholars has more fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, you know, that's a matter that's known from dealing with the scholars and interacting with them on a personal basis. And then some Sheikh mentioned that the position that's going to be followed is the position that gets the person closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu alam. You can return back to the works of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Saleh al Uthaymeen, Rahimullah Ta'ala, dealing with the differences that take place amongst the ulama. So it's an excellent book. I believe it's translated into the English language, and it's a good benefit. And he brings a lot of uh, points that we are in need of as beginning students of knowledge. You know, especially when dealing with how we to interact with one another when, in times of differing and what are the matters we can differ over and what matters we are not allowed to differ in. These are some very important points mentioned by the noble Sheikh Muhammad ibn Saleh al Uthaymeen rahimahullah ta'ala. The question is, can you give some advice regarding what manners we should have with our teachers as we are beginners in this path of knowledge? Myself, you know, subhanAllah wa bihamdi, I'm still in the beginning stages of learning. I don't see myself as being no strong student of knowledge. I'm a beginner. You know, and I, I just do my best to share, you know, with the brothers that which I have come across from the statements of the ulama and the explanations of the ulama and that which is from the teachings of the ulama and I do my best to connect the brothers to the ulama and I encourage the brothers to be connected to the ulama one mannerism that I ask you brothers to have with me that if you ever see or hear from me an error correct me and do not hesitate to correct me this is one thing I do request from you brothers. You know, in the classes that we have, if 
I make an error, I make a mistake, correct me. And I have no problem with being correct. Inshallah ta'ala, you'll find me to be receptive to the correction. I'm not perfect. I don't claim perfection. And I don't claim to know everything. And I don't believe that I know everything. There's a lot of things I don't know about Islam. And I'm open, you know, for constructive criticism. So don't be afraid. I don't feel any kind of way or any shyness that you have to correct me or critique me or something or advise me about something. So feel comfortable with that. Because I don't, I don't want to be upon that which is wrong. And I don't want nobody just gathering in the gatherings and being like yes men. You know, whatever I say, yes, yes, mashallah. No, subhanAllah behind me, you know something that I have said that's against what is correct, say, you know, you know, about Last one. Now, the point again is, uh, Barakallah Fikram, Ikhwan, you know, I, I encourage the brothers, first and foremost, to have good manners with Allah, subhanAllah. And to have good mannerisms with the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And to have good manners with one another. With your colleagues of one another. And our gathering here is for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So we almost, we, we always must keep that foremost in our minds. Our purpose here in this dunya and our purpose for gathering is cooperating with one another upon righteousness and piety. And in doing so, you know, again, if you see from me an error, a mistake, God will call off you. Can please bring it to my attention and don't hesitate. You know, there's a principle in Islam, لا يجوز تأخير البيان وقت الحاجة. That is not permissible to delay clarifying an affair at the time of need. Well, I, Ikhwan, I'm not looking for an anyone to be some type of yes man or I'm looking for you know to have like you know, a following and then well I don't care for that stuff I don't in subhanAllah behind me and these type of things destroy students of knowledge. Having the fan club and the yes men around them. These people don't command the right and forbid the wrong. They don't tell an individual when he's mistaken. Because that's so and so. SubhanAllah don't don't do this with me, please. Well, I, 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 I hate it. I don't like people like that. I don't like people around me like that. Because it's not good for the individual. It breaks the person's back. People gassing the person up. Yeah, man, you know, you this shit. I don't like that. You know, your brother in Islam, you know, we just trying to do something good, cooperating with one another. This is how we have to be. Because when we are not like this with one another, being sincere with one another, the relationship is going to be a detriment for the both of us. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that deen on nasiha. The deen is nasiha. Niman, ya Rasulullah, qala lillahi wa li kitabihi wa li rasulihi wa li a'imatu muslimin wa a'amatihim. The deen is nasiha. He said, well, who is the nasiha for? He said, for Allah. It was for his book, for his messenger. For the rulers of the Muslims and their common folk. We have to have nasiha with one another. And in in, in not advising one another when there's a need to advise one another, this is not from the nasiha. And not correcting one another when we need to correct one another, this is not from nasiha. And not directing one another to that which is good and warning, of another, warning one another from that which is evil, this is not from nasiha. So we have to have nasiha with one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then I advise and encourage the brothers, make sure, and this advice is for me first and foremost, that we purify our, our intentions and why we are studying this book. We must purify our intentions and why we are studying this book and why we are gathering here. This is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how we're supposed to be. It's not to seek any fame. It's not for the purpose for any worldly matter. We study 
and seek this knowledge to get closer to our Lord and to remove ignorance from ourselves and to be able to benefit the people with what we have learned and to remove ignorance from them by the permission of Allah and before that to practice what we have learned protecting ourselves from the evil knowing what is the correct aqidah these are the mannerisms that the students of knowledge should have because this is how we find the Prophet وسلم, he was very sincere the Prophet وسلم, he wasn't a show off the Prophet وسلم, just, he didn't just want people just following him rather he commanded the people to follow him based upon what he had from the revelation what he had from the truth and you see that when the Prophet وسلم, made the mistake in the Salah and Dhul Yadain said to him after he made the Taslim after two raka'ah, he was praying Salat al or Salat al-Asr. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, and look at the wisdom and the mannerisms of Dhul Yadain, and then look at the mannerisms of the Messenger of Allah. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, did you forget in the Salah, or was the Salah shortened? Or vice versa, O oh, Messenger of Allah, was the, shalat, was the Salah shortened, or did you forget? So the Prophet said, said, the Salah wasn't shortened, meaning it wasn't changed from four raka'ahs to two. It wasn't shortened, nor did I forget. And then Dhul Yadain, radiallahu an, he said, Rather, O Messenger of Allah, you forgot. Because when the Prophet sallallahu clearly stated it wasn't shortened, then he knew that his action wasn't from revelation, that rather it came from forgetfulness. So he said, Rather, O Messenger of Allah, you forgot. And the Prophet sallallahu said, Is what he's saying is true? And the people confirmed it. The Prophet sallallahu stood up, made two raka'ah, Taslim then made two extra prostrations for the for the mistake of adding to the prayer and then made another taslim. You don't find that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi started to have some type of hatred against Dhul Yadain because he corrected him. And we following the Sunnah, let's follow this Sunnah right here. This is also from the Sunnah. We, want to follow, we have to follow everything from the Sunnah, Ikhwan. Barakallah. Not just take parts of the Sunnah and then leave off other parts of the Sunnah. And we practice what we want from the Sunnah. No, everything. Ahl Sunnah, we practice everything from the Sunnah. That's why we are the people of the Sunnah, because we're the ones who hold to the Sunnah more so than anyone. No one follows the Sunnah the way we follow the Sunnah. It's something that we have to live up to. Barakallah. These are some advices for myself, first and foremost, and for your brothers. You know, and whatever you learn, teach your families. Even if you have them sitting close and listening to the class and taking notes, that's fine. You know, and if you can't teach your family yourself, put them in a position to learn. You know, from starting with the ulama and their students and the likes. These are some advices, you know, that encourage you, brothers. And, uh, Ikhwan, another point, and not, and not to be too long, please do not be negligent when it comes to learning the Qur'an. The Qur'an is the foundation. Al-Imam, Sheikh Ibn Baz, rahimahullah ta'ala, was asked, what is the best book of Aqidah? And Al-Imam Ibn Baz, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, the Qur'an. So make sure you brothers take time out to memorize the Qur'an. And the best method of memorizing the Qur'an, the method that was used by the Sahaba. They memorized ten verses, and they wouldn't move on to another ten until they understood those verses, and they practiced that which was in those verses, and then they would move on to the next ten. This is why when an individual from amongst them was known that he had memorized Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Ali Imran, they had a lot of respect for that person. Because they knew that that's a lot of knowledge and practice with, within those two surahs. Now, Jazakumullah Khayrin. Inshallah, Ikhwan, we'll stop at this point. We've been going long now. And uh, we don't want to be overburdensome. And that was the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He tried not to speak too long and be too long to wear out the listeners. And may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala increase 
all of us in good, and make our gatherings gatherings which entail his remembrance in getting closer to him, gatherings out of for his sake alone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from showing off and seeking fame. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst the people that if we fall into error, we quickly retract and repent. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who love him and whom he loves. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathers together with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the Sahaba in the hereafter. Whatever is correct, praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Whatever is incorrect is for myself. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك السلام عليكم ورحمه الله